because you think, bailout, what does that have to do with Scripture? What does that have to do with my life? Uh, I'm not being bailed out. You know, uh, I I've, I've, I've get my pension check or I get my Social Security or I have worked hard and I don't need a bailout. So what about somebody that may need a, a bailout? But what they, this economy has done, it's affected everybody because it involves a person's livelihood. And when we think about when our livelihood gets in the forefront, then all of a sudden our amount of concern rises. Let me give you a physical example of that. When you near death and your livelihood is threatened, you begin to think about a lot of things differently. And you begin to think, well, well if I had known this, I'd have done this had I known that. And you also begin to realize what's really important. It begins to change. You say, well, look, I can't take this billion dollars with me to the grave. I can't do this. I can't do that. Uh, I'm not going to see these people anymore. And all of a sudden, you want to see them. You want to spend time with them. So it, it gives us a kind of a reality check. And it helps you to recognize the reason for and, and how we live, how we, how we conduct our lives. And so presently, the obsessive thoughts of people are focused around and centered around the economy. The dollars and cents that they have or they don't have, or the threat towards their economy for the future. Because we're looking at a, an incredible national debt. And we're looking at borrowing money that we don't have by printing more money. We'll just print more. And I think all of us tend to think that, wow, if I could solve my problems that easily. It's kind of like the lady said when she was called into question by her bank. And she said, told that she had overdrawn her bank account. She says, I can't have overdrawn my bank account because I still have checks in my checkbook. You know, and you fail, well, as long as you've got checks in your checkbook, you can write checks. Well, we have to realize that our, our society is a little bit like that. But the great reality is that without God, we are all bankrupt. And that isn't where mankind is thinking right now. But it's amazing how when the dollar is called into question, all of a sudden our concern rises. And we're trying to, how do we fix this problem? When we talk about being bankrupt when it comes to God, then we don't seem to think that way. But I would help us to hope that we could see that God is certainly capable, and He has helped mankind and can help mankind to gain a correct focus. And in all of those things, it is amazing how the focus of people is beginning to ch change. People talk about, well, the, the need to, um, as Jesus put it, give us this day our daily bread and appreciate it. People talk about the, the need for just being able to conserve, and, and it's about family, it's about relationships that you have, because they can no longer afford to go and do the things. I hear people that you never dream of hearing them talk about how wonderful it would be to have work, who hated work before, but now said, if, if I could work, I, you know, I would find so much Enjoyment. They're stuck at home now with no place to go. And after a while, even the video games get tiring. And, and they aren't able to go and do what they want. So it changes that way. But I would suggest that what the world needs is a bailout from God. That is God's help. And it's not unprecedented in this regard because we all have experienced at times in our lives where we say, Lord, help. Or God, save me, because we're in a dire situation. So it isn't impossible for God to do that. In fact, I think that we can see that God has done that on a large-scale basis. God bailed out this world when it was so bad, according to Scripture, with the flood. Now, not many people, while the, world, while the rest of the world was in liquidation, Moses or Noah rather stayed afloat. While the rest of the world, he and his family. So God bailed them out. 
we see that God bailed out Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage. They didn't have a penny to their name. And yet God bailed them out of that situation. So I think that individually we can see how God has bailed out prophets. He's bailed out people from the situations in which they are in. God spared Elijah. God spared, you know, the, the woman with the cruise of oil. And he kept her going. God spared people and bailed them out physically and their health problems, issues, you know, giving them extra years of life. So God has bailed them out in numerous ways. God bailed out David. We can recognize that. God bailed out, as I hear Jeanette saying, Jamal. But the question we want to ask along that, was everybody pleased with God's bailout? Was everybody pleased with God's bailout? I would suggest that, no, not everybody is pleased with God's bailout. But I'd like to take a look at a scripture in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 25, because Leviticus chapter 25 is about the year of the Jubilee. Now, I think most of you are familiar with the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year was the 50th year in which people were forgiven their debts, they were proclaimed to be free, and there's a number of things that I think that we can learn from this Jubilee year. So we'll begin here in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 8, where... We're told here, it says, count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. The fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. For it is a jubilee and as it is holy to you, eat only what is taken directly from the fields. And in this year, verse 13 of the Jubilee, everyone is to return to his own property. Now, what I think that we're going to see here are some very, very interesting things in which God deals with property, finances, family, and situations that you get yourself in for Israel. He gave them some guidelines, some directives, some laws on how things ought to be done. But what we want to pick up from this are some concepts that he is teaching us here. One is that we've already read in verses 8 and 9 is atonement. Now what does atonement mean? Atonement, we, we think about atonement, we're thinking about a redemption, we're thinking about a rescuing, we think about relieving, reconciling, a reconciling reality that we, we've talked about at one. Bringing people back into the fold, as it were. And that's exactly what the Jubilee year did. It, it brought people back into the fold. People who had made mistakes, uh, bl financial blunders. And they could get back what God had, noted, what God had given to them. You know, the thing about ancient Israel, God gave them all the land. God told them what to do. He gave them all the land and then they divided it up. They didn't pay a penny for it. God gave them. And then he says, I want to make it possible that you keep this land which I have given to you. Now think about our world today. People don't think about the fact that God has given us this earth. God has created the heavens and the earth. God has created everything. That God owns everything. Oh no, we tend to think that we have title to this earth. It's mine. And I get to keep it. Because what? I've worked, or I have connived, or I have outfigured everybody else, and therefore it is mine, mine, mine. 